Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, I can't hear you all so well, so um, I'm just going to talk. And I can see Fred in the front. So Fred, wave your hands if there's anything that um, I need to. Uh, OK. <laughs> um, so thank you, everybody, for letting me participate remotely. I'm sorry not to be there. And I, I'm certainly missing the, um, the uh, macchiatos at the cafe upstairs. So, um, but uh, I've been able to chime in for most of this, um, uh, watching it on the web stream, which is really awesome. So thank you all um, at the center for making that possible. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Um, this is, I'm going to present some results from a paper that just came out a few weeks ago in Science um, with the same title, The Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation Without a Role for Ocean Circulation. And this is a collaboration with myself and a former student, Katinka Bellomo, uh, Lisa Murphy, Mark Kane, and then um, some colleagues from Germany, Thorsten Mortensen, Gabby Riddell, and Bjorn Stevens. So this is figure one from the paper. Is it, um, you've seen many versions of this in this um, in the talks earlier today, and I think yesterday as well. On the left panel is the time series of North Atlantic sea surface temperature linearly detrended, de as Neil Tandon um, warned us against. But um, it's common in the literature, at least at this point. Um, and uh, on the right-hand side is the regression of sea surface temperature, sea level pressure, and winds on that AMO index. And as many people have discussed, um, there's centers of action in the North Atlantic and in the tropical Atlantic, but the whole basin is warmer. And it's associated with a characteristic pattern of atmospheric circulation that you see, which is a weak subtropical high. It, um, a particular phase of the NAO as well projects onto this. And then significant trade wind um, variability in the uh, tropics as well. So what drives the NAO? And I think we've heard, um, we've heard many um, talks about this already. Um, my read of the literature, and, um, and I think it's consistent with what we've heard, is, is basically that naturally occurring changes in the strength of the AMOC can change the amount of heat that's delivered to the North Atlantic, and that, that, that appears is an SST signature. And then the, I, you've heard talks just recently about how those might impact, in turn, feedback on the atmospheric circulation. So this uh, idea has obviously been tested in many of the couple models um, from around the world. And um, there is, does be a connection between the strength of the AMOC and the temperature of the North Atlantic. And so that, that relationship has been borne out. It's also been shown in paleoclimate simulations where the, um, where the, uh, where, where the AMOC is shut down by filling the North Atlantic with fresh water. And you see a cold North Atlantic at that time. And uh, that's consistent with paleoclimate observations as well. So this, this does appear to play out in climate models, but the question is causality. And uh, so we take a different approach rather than taking, looking at all the fields together, which as we've seen by the talks, for example, by Tom Delworth, um, that there is a, there, these fields, atmospheric fields are correlated with ocean fields and SST. But here, instead, what we did was um, took a different approach and asked the question, how do the features of the climate simulation, in this case of the AMO, but it can be applied to other climate phenomena as well, change by progressively turning off elements of the climate model? Uh, so this slide shows my view of what a climate hierarchy would look like. And actually, we're working with people at NCAR to develop community versions of all of these different elements of the climate mo model hierarchy that will be served to the uh, community and available and supported um, to the community with the next CESM release. So that's just a little plug for the work that I've been doing with NCAR people, Brian Medeiros in particular, and I have a uh, research scientist working there, Jim Benedict, um, on the AquaPlanet. Uh, version of the model that will be available to the community. And then Lorenzo Pavani and colleagues have been working on, if you go further down, 
the dynamical core and possibly single column versions of CESM, basically. So that's the bigger picture, but now today I'm just going to talk about the first three components, which are um, you know, the fully coupled model at the top with an atmosphere coupled to land and ocean model. And you've seen many um, results from that type of model thus far. And we simplify that by replacing the ocean general circulation with the slab ocean model, and um, which still has a land model in it, um, and looking at results comparing those two. And then further simplify things by prescribing SST simulations, um, or prescribing SST in simulations with the coupled to the atmosphere and land model. And those are courtesy of people at NCAR um, who've, who've done those runs for other reasons. So more details about what we are, what I'm going to show. The um, we're showing, um, I'll show you results from fully coupled models, both from CMIP-3 archive and CMIP-5 uh, pre-industrial runs. So here we are simplifying our lives by taking out this time-varying forcing um, so we can at least uh, not, not be, um, not uh, complicate matters as Neil has pointed out by introduce the time varying forcing. And then um, the next set of simulations are from the CMIP-3 archive, which is atmospheric GCMs coupled to 50 meter slab ocean. And there are 13 such models. Um, 12 of them were in the CMIP-3 archive. And then there's an additional one with the NCAR CCSM-3 or CAM-4 coupled to 50 meter slab that was done at NCAR separately. And uh, these runs were done, just kind of interesting historical note, for um, not for the purpose of looking at internal variability, but actually for estimating equilibrium climate sensitivity, which is done differently in CMIP-5, and so we don't have the corresponding set of slab ocean models. But to all the people from big modeling centers out there, I would encourage you uh, to, to um, make long runs of the slab model because I think that there's a lot of interesting internal variability in those models that is worth looking at. I hope to convince you of that today. Um, so in this configuration, the atmosphere and ocean are thermally coupled or thermodynamically coupled. So they're exchanging heat and moisture, but there is no interactive ocean heat transport so that winds can blow stronger over the ocean and there'll be no change in the ocean heat transport convergence that then affects the surface temperature. And I think an earlier talk uh, um, in this session showed the equation there is the tendency is equal to the surface fluxes plus a prescribed Q flux, which, are, um, which is meant to include the mean influence of ocean heat transport on the simulated sea surface temperature, but doesn't vary with time. And then I'll also show some results from the atmosphere coupled to the um, uh, uncoupled and um, the prescribed sea surface temperature um, in CAM4. So let me just pause there. Are there any questions? And maybe this is a good test of whether I can hear you. Any questions from the audience? No? Right, then I'll move on. Is the sound okay? Can someone just yell if the sound's okay? Because I can't see anybody anymore. Answers, there was no question right now. What's that? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, the, the answer is there was no question at the moment. And is the sound okay? The sound is okay. Okay, great. All right, so the first question we ask is how do the spatial patterns pair with and without interactive ocean heat transport? So let's return to that picture that I showed earlier of the, of the pattern of sea surface temperature and atmospheric circulation that goes with this North Atlantic SS index shown below at the bottom left. And if we look at this same um, pattern, which is the regression on the unfiltered time series, so this is just the annual mean sea surface temperature, uh, you see that this coupled models, these are fully coupled models now, simulate something that basically looks like the observations in the sense that there's a weaker subtropical high and warmer, um, warmer North Atlantic and tropical Atlantic at uh, the time when the AMO is positive. Um, and the pattern agrees very well. And there are signals in the tropical Atlantic, um, and there are signals in the wind fields as well that go with this pattern. So our argument is this looks 
very much like the observations. And this is from the fully coupled models. And I would say the usual interpretation of this would be that um, this variability is, is um, at least in part related to changes in ocean circulation. But then we, we do the same calculation using just the slab models, and we find that the pattern doesn't change. Uh, so that you have the same weakening subtropical high, surface wind anomalies. In fact, in this case, actually, um, the, the tropical anomalies look a little bit more like observations um, in the slab version than fully coupled in the sense that the tropical wind anomalies are uh, somewhat larger um, in response to the warm, or at this, when the Atlantic is warm, than in the fully coupled models. I'll come back to that point a little bit. So one question that came up um, in reviews of this paper and discussions with people, some are who, are who are in the room, is maybe it's only at the low frequencies that the impact is, of the ocean is apparent. And so if we redo the calculation um, that I just showed and look at the regression of sea surface temperature on the, um, call it the AMO index, the top panel is the unfiltered version, and the bottom panel is the um, low-pass filter for the 10-year um, Langsos filter. So what you see here, and this is for the coupled models, so what you see here is that at the, at the lower frequency, so on longer than 10-year time scales, that you start to see an amplification of the signal in the subpolar region compared to the tropical region. Um, although even in the filtered version, so maybe even at higher frequencies, the, the subtropical sig component of the AMO is larger than the tropical component. But then if we do the same calculation for all the models that we have uh, and look at the multi-model mean, the, you get basically the same answer, which is that the pattern looks a lot, um, looks very similar um, even on low frequencies. So it, at this point, it doesn't look particularly, um, it, it looks like the slab model is reproducing a lot of the main features, some, many of which are discussed here in, in this conference um, as the coupled models. Well, maybe that's not surprising. It, you know, it, it's just the, the, the mean state that is responding, that the, the pattern is set up. But is it possible that, um, oh, before I go on, I, I just, point out that if you do the same calculation, we're looking at the unfiltered in the top panel and the low pass filter in the bottom panel from different SST data sets, that I think, and may be a subject for discussion, that the amplification of the high latitude signal is not as apparent in the observations as it is in the coupled models. In other words, the, in the low frequency, the whole basin appears to be responding or, or co-varying on, on, on the lower frequency time scales just as it does on the higher frequency time scales, whereas in the coupled models, the lower frequency seems to be um, more in the high latitude regions. Um, I think Tom Delworth may mention that, or maybe Rong Jang earlier in her talk, but I missed that, um, that, uh, that Maybe this has something to do with deficiencies in the climate model simulations of, um, of clouds in the Atlantic, but that's another talk. So what about the temporal characteristics? So we have this pattern that emerges in the slab model, and I'll, sh I'll talk about the mechanism in a moment, but let's just look at what the time um, characteristics of the, uh, of the couple models and the slab models look like. So the left panel is the spectrum of the slab models in red. So that's a, the, the red line is the multi-model mean spectrum. And the red shading is the, is the min-max of all the models. And what I think you can see is if you compare that with the same calculation for the couple models that the two line up very well. And there, um, doesn't, it doesn't, there doesn't seem to be any significant differences in the multi-model mean sense between the AMO simulation and slab model and couple models. Now, I will note that we, don't have, we only have a few long slab model runs. One is NCARS, NCARS. If any of you have long slab versions, I would 
love to see them. Um, but NCAR is the only one that I have the ability to, to actually make simulations of um, myself. Uh, so on the right-hand panel is the same CMIP3 spectrum in blue. And then we put CMIP5 on top. Again, these are pre-industrial simulations. So um, what you can see is that there's, there's no significant difference between these two in a multi-model mean sense between the two spectra. Um, it's interesting that CMIP5 simulates a much stronger interannual peak in the, um, in the AMO, but my interpretation of this is that, um, that, that that's made a tropical uh, Pacific force signature that's in the, um, that appears in the tropical Atlantic uh, SST. Any questions here on this? All right, I'll move no on. Questions. So this picture is for Gap, and I don't know if he's still in the audience, but I showed him that last figure a, a while back, and he said, well, that's not fair. You, um, you could be hiding differences between individual slab and coupled versions that don't appear in the multi-model mean sense or when you kind of shade out all the individual models. And so we, for the models that we had where we had more than 70 years of simulation of the slab model, we compare the, the fully coupled with the slab versions of individual, six individual models. And overall, uh, there are, uh, the slab versions of the models are not significantly different. In fact, some of them actually simulate more variability um, in the AMO than the coupled versions. I'll point out the UK Met Office simulation. And except for the GFPL CMP2.0 model, and there you can see that there's significantly more variability in the um, sort of multi-decadal time scales in the coupled model compared to the slab model. And if you separate, if you break down components of the, uh, the contribution from the tropics versus the high latitudes, most of that comes from subpolar gyre variability, or subpolar SST variability. And I think you heard Tom talk about um, the mechanisms, some of the mechanisms of subpolar um, heat content variability. Um, we've heard a lot about that in this session already. So, uh, so we have a simulation with the slab model that looks a lot like the, the observation, or it looks a lot like the couple model, both in time and space characteristics. And it looks like observations. So what is the mechanism that produces that? And our interpretation of this is that the AMO in the slab models is the response to stochastic forcing from the mid-latitude atmospheric circulation, i.e. the NAO, with thermal coupling in tropics playing an important role. And by thermal coupling, I mean um, what the earlier talk in the session pointed out, uh, exchange of heat and moisture between the upper ocean and the atmosphere, but not necessarily any role for ocean dynamics in the tropics. So to demonstrate this, we looking at a, um, the NAO in a, version, in a simulation with CAM4 with prescribed climatological SSTs. I, that is uncoupled. And here you see a regression of sea level pressure and winds on the subtropical high index. Could have done this on the NAO and you, you get basically similar results. But the, um, so you see that pattern of wind variability, in, particularly in the subtropics and, and in latitudes. And on the right hand side is a spectrum of the subtropical high. Uh, index, which is which we'd expect. Um, and then we do is compare what's in the, the same regression. Now in this slide, comparing the left-hand side, the sea level pressure and, and surface winds um, with, on the right-hand side, CAM4 coupled to a the slab ocean version. And this is low pass filtered, so to emphasize some of the, the thermally coupled parts. You could do the same, get it, basically this picture anytime you, you, uh, you filter with more than basically a year of, um, of low pass filtering. And you see here that the main, that the, first of all, the pattern with the large uh, signals in the mid latitude and tropical region uh, emerging 
as a response to changes in the strength of the subtropical high, which in our interpretation of this is, is uh, basically internally generated in the atmosphere. But with the main difference between the left-hand panel and the right-hand panel is in the tropics. So obviously there's no sea surface temperature change on the left-hand side because we prescribed the sea surface temperature. But on the right-hand side, what you see is there's wind signal in the tropics that is absent in the uncoupled version. And um, that, that shows that the trade winds weaken at times when the subtropical high is weaker. And that our, so our interpretation of that is, is that is the main driver of the, of the, the sea surface temperature anomalies via a wind evaporation surface temperature feedback that I think you heard about in a talk earlier in the session that is absent in the um, prescribed case. So you can have an NAO, but in order to get a tropics wide, or an Atlantic wide signal in response to the NAO variability, um, you need to have thermal coupling in the tropics. That the signal will not extend into the tropics unless there's a feedback between the upper ocean heat um, tent and the atmosphere, atmospheric circulation. Um, just one thing that I find interesting about these results is if we compare the uncoupled run in spectra in blue and the slab model in red, again, this is the, just the CAM model, um, that the spectra are white for mid-latitude winds, um, zonal and meridional winds, and zonal winds in the tropics. It would look the same if I did the, um, showed you the subtropical high in index itself. But the main difference between the uncoupled and thermally coupled cases is in the meridional wind in the tropics. So that coupling with the upper ocean produces meridional wind anomalies that give you persistence um, that is more like a red spectrum. And um, most of the rest of the, uh, of the wind variability is uncoupled. And I think that's, you know, I, I think that's it's an open question about how much the upper ocean heat content is feeding back on the atmospheric circulation. In this simulations, it looks like the only place where that's happening is in the meridional winds in the tropics. And just this is a slide from a former student line and um, illustrating the mechanisms. This is probably not necessary for this audience, but I'll just walk through it. So, the interpretation is that the NAO variability um, in the, that extends into the subtropics but not into the tropics produces tr um, trade wind anomalies. So a weaker subtropical high um, will produce weaker trade winds. Through a west feedback produces warmer SSTs. The SST gradients associated with that then um, allow the signal to, or have an atmospheric circulation response which weakens the trade winds and produces a, a SST anomaly in that extent. So you can end up basically filling out the entire tropical Atlantic with if they uh, call it a, a uh, forcing from the subtropical, subtropical high. Um, so three points that I wanted to end on. The fully coupled slab ocean models produce an AMO that does have uh, the spatial characteristics of the observations. And in this case, has red spectrum uh, in an overall multi-model mean sense. That interactive ocean heat transports um, in cloud models do not change the space-time spectrum of the characteristics of the AMO, again, in an overall robust sense. Individual models such as the GFPL may produce um, variability that looks um, that is enhanced in the subpolar gyre, and I don't, I don't, I be surprised if that's happening in the real world also. But uh, it's not necessary to create this pattern, and um, and does it necess does change the overall um, AMO variability in most models? And then the, inter the physical interpretation is that the AMO in models is the upper ocean thermal response to the NAO, and then a tropical signal emerges through thermal coupling. Um, so you can think of the AMO as a hybrid force thermally coupled mode. So um, I don't know how I'm doing on time. Can somebody yell out how much time I have left? I 
hear laughter, but I don't hear any, any, any numbers. I think you've talked for about a half hour. So, Have I? So we should probably take questions if that's okay yes. with you. 